Good evening. Uh, I'm Tom Baldwin. I'm the Dean of the College of Natural and Agricult Agricultural Sciences here at UC Riverside, and I would like to welcome you to our campus. Uh, this is the second of a series of three lectures that we're having uh, here on the campus uh, this fall. Uh, the, it's a continuation of the series of five lectures that we had last spring that was entitled um, The uh, Science of Evolution. Uh, the objective of these three lectures, based upon feedback that we got from the people who attended the spring lectures, was to look at the use of evolutionary uh, theory, evolutionary thought, in specific research projects, programs to dr dr uh, drill down a little bit deeper. The lectures in the spring were intended to cover the broad spectrum of evolutionary thinking across not too deep a, a, a level, but to cover some rather broad territory. Um, two weeks ago, we heard from Lynn Nunney, who gave the first lecture. He talked about the use of evolutionary principles in thinking about uh, the processes of cancer, the development of cancers uh, in, um, in animals. Uh, tonight, we're going to be hearing from another University of California Riverside faculty member. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, evolution of a, uh, a trait in the mouse, um, the process or trait of hyperactivity. But before I introduce tonight's speaker, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of things. First of all, uh, last spring, Last spring, one of the speakers was Dave Resnick. He talked about um, the uh, origin of species then and now. Uh, and the title of his book, uh, which he talked about, he mentioned at that time, uh, is The Origin of the Species Then and Now, An Interpretive Guide to the Origin of Species. Uh, the book has just been published uh, this uh, month. Uh, we had hoped to have a signing uh, event for anyone who wanted to get a copy of this book. Uh, but unfortunately, Dave was un unable to be here. Uh, but you can uh, pick up this book at the bookstore, or you can order it online. I'm, I haven't looked, but I would imagine you can get it from Amazon. You can get anything from Amazon. Uh, so uh, if you're interested, uh, I have a copy of this here, and you can take a look at it. I also, I also wanted, wanted to mention that tonight's speaker uh, Ted Garland uh, has a, a, a book um, right here. It's entitled uh, Experimental Evolution, Concepts, Methods, and Applications of Selection Experiments. Uh, so again, if you're interested in this, we'll have a copy here that you can look through uh, at the end of the lecture. There's also information about these books that are on the table uh, out front. Now to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Ted Garland uh, was uh, raised in uh, Las Vegas, was a student at UNLV, where he received both his bachelor's uh, and his master's degrees. Uh, he then came to the University of California uh, to one of our sister campuses at Irvine, uh, where he received his PhD. Uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Washington. And following that, he joined the faculty at the University of Wisconsin, uh, where he spent 14 years uh, before uh, returning to Southern California in 01. Uh, I understand that they have serious wonders there, right, Ted? So um, Ted's specialty is called evolutionary physiology. It's a field that he helped to pioneer and the field in which he is perhaps the most eminent practitioner. Evolutionary physiology applies to concepts of evolutionary biology to, uh, to in, the, in areas of physiology. Uh, physiology is an area of, of biology that basically uh, tries to answer questions of how the, how the machine works. Muscle physiology focuses on how muscles work. Renal physiology focuses on issues of how the kidney functions. Cardiac physiology, the heart, and so on. So it's how organ systems work. Uh, so his talk tonight uh, is going to be uh, entitled um, Born to Run, uh, Hyperactivity uh, in Mice. Ted? <laughs> 
first, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, well, in theory, they should turn up the volume up there, I believe. Mic's on. So, how's that? Can you hear now? Yes, no? Yes, no? Okay. Okay, well, first of all, let me thank all of you for coming, and then a few additional acknowledgments. The Science Circle for providing some funding. Uh, I don't think they have an official logo, and so I just made one up in PowerPoint. I'm sure they can do a better job than that, just a, a circle with some words, but, uh, but that'll be a challenge for them anyway. Um, second, National Science Foundation, the college for inviting me, the dean, and so forth. And in addition to that, I have a long list of people here on the left. These are people here at UCR, including many of my graduate students. I didn't list all the undergraduates' names because there are too many of those. Postdocs, other faculty, some of you are here in the audience tonight. On the right, lots of people that are at other universities besides UCR. And the main point of this is just that they're the people who do all the work while I'm stuck in front of the computer writing grants and, and things like that. So as uh, Dean Baldwin mentioned, we do in our lab what's called evolutionary physiology. And so it's a hybrid field, an adjective and a noun. And you can see on the left here, we have the evolutionary part. And this is where we're interested in such questions as how do populations change over time as the frequencies of the genes in the population change? How can we use model organisms, maybe things like fruit flies, Drosophila, to understand basic uh, genetic and evolutionary kinds of principles? How important is natural selection as opposed to, say, random genetic drift or sexual selection in shaping the biological diversity that we see, the differences among species? Now, on the right-hand side, as Dean Baldwin said, we're interested in how organisms work and how can we use model organisms to elucidate basic physiological principles. What's the line between maybe what we might call normal individual variation and where we move into the range of pathologies that would be of interest in medicine? And how do we promote health and cure disease? Now, I like to think that evolutionary physiology is more than just sort of one from this column and one from that column, and that there are these sorts of questions such as how does the way organisms work, the way they're put together, influence or maybe constrain the way they can evolve? And so it's those sorts of questions that I think form are really at the heart of the field. Because it's a hybrid field, and I couldn't quite decide which way to go with the introduction, I decided that I would just give two different introductions. So here's the first one, 1.0. This is the sort of more evolutionary kind of introduction. And it will start with an observation about the behavior of animals in nature. On the left, you can see a picture of an animal that you've probably all seen running around here in Riverside, our friend the coyote. These are animals that move long distances, typically on a daily basis, when they're foraging or going about their social interactions and so forth. And on the right, we have a sloth. And a sloth is an animal that may spend many days, maybe even weeks, in a single tree. It just doesn't move very far at all. And as you may be aware, a sloth can't even move very fast. If you, if you put them on the ground, the speed at which they can actually move their arms and legs is extremely slow. It's like an animal functioning in slow motion. So when biologists see this kind of variation among species, we think about coming up with explanations at two different levels. The first one is what's usually called ultimate or evolutionary causation. So these are questions about why has this diversity evolved, and we want to know what kinds of natural selection might have pushed these organisms, like the coyote and the sloth, in different directions. Is it perhaps the foraging behavior, or maybe the social behavior of the coyote that has caused it to have these large home ranges, long movement distances, and so forth? Or maybe is it something related to sexual selection? Now, the other kind of explanation that's of interest, the more physiological one, is just how do these different kinds of animals work? What is it that's so fundamentally different about the muscle of a sloth and the corresponding muscle of a coyote? So we're talking about basic morphology and physiology. Now, what I'm going to emphasize today along these lines is when you have the evolution of a voluntary behavior, in this case, daily movement distance, which we can measure conveniently by giving mice in the laboratory access to running wheels, to what extent do we see changes in the performance abilities of the animals, that is, their exercise physiology, their endurance capacity, and so forth, and to what extent do we see changes in the brain that reflect what you might call the motivation 
for being active, or maybe the reward that they receive from being physically active. So continuing on this theme about uh, diversity in, in behavior, uh, on this graph, I, I'm not going to show you too many graphs of data, but I will show a few because that's the sort of currency of science is data and representations of those data. So on the, uh, the vertical axis there, you've got the home range size of a bunch of different kinds of mammals. And on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, you've got the body mass. It's on a logarithmic scale. And each of those black dots represents the value for a given species, like a wolf or a coyote or a deer or something like that. And then I fitted a line to those data. And you can see it describes this general trend uh, so that larger bodied animals tend to move around more. They have larger home ranges, and that's not surprising at all. But what might be more surprising is that if you look at any given body size in the vertical direction, and you sort of go over to the axis on your left there, you'll see that it, it spans three of those units. Now, those units are factors of 10. So that means you have a thousand-fold range of variation in home range size for a given size animal. That's just a mind-boggling range of variation in terms of the size of the home range. So what might account for this variation? Well, if we just start most simply by breaking it down into these two different kinds of animals, the carnivora and the ungulates, things like deer and antelope, we see that some of the variation is related to what kind of animal you are. Well, why might that be? Well, one obvious possibility is diet. So the ungulates, they're eating plants. The, herbiv the carnivores, on the other hand, they're eating the ungulates. They're eating the herbivores. Now, you would imagine that if you're eating plants, you probably don't have to move around as far, typically, as if you're looking for the animals that themselves are eating plants. And so it's possible that, whoops, it's possible that these differences we see here between the carnivores and the ungulates are just a direct environmental effect. That's what many ecologists might think. So, for example, if we could rent out the Rose Bowl, which is actually artificial grass turf, in spite of the fact that they make it so nice it looks like it's astroturf, it really is grass. So if we could rent out the Rose Bowl and we could fill it full of a bunch of deer and a bunch of wolves, and we put in a bunch of steaks so that the wolves wouldn't have to eat the deer, it might be the case that the wolves wouldn't move around any more than the deer because they don't need to. They can just sit there and eat the steaks right off the ground. And so the difference in home range between those carnivores and herbivores would disappear. Now, nobody's ever done that experiment. I don't know why, but, uh, but that, that's a possibility. But on the other hand, if you start looking a little more at these animals, for example, here's a plot of, on your vertical axis, home range size adjusting out for the effects of body size. And on your horizontal axis, this is the length of the hind limbs. And again, each of the black points is a different species of, of carnivore. And what you can see is there's a quite a strong relationship between leg length and the size of the home range. So what that implies then is that animals that move further tend to have specializations, in this case, morphological adaptations that promote their ability to move long distances. So that suggests there's something more to this difference in home range than just <clears throat> the animals move how far they need to on a daily basis to get their resources and so forth. Now, studying these kinds of questions is really cool with charismatic megafauna like lions and tigers and bears and things. But these are really not the most convenient organisms with which to study these kinds of things, especially if you want to take an experimental approach. I mean, you can get a polar bear, and you can actually run it on a treadmill, wearing a mask, measure its metabolic rate and endurance, and so forth. But we usually use one, lose one or two grad students in the process, and so it becomes kind of a, a limiting proposition. And so instead of working on these guys, it's possible to take an experimental evolution approach. Now, experimental evolution we define simply as research in which populations are studied across multiple generations. So you can track the changes that occur from generation to generation. And you do this under defined and reproducible conditions so that in principle you could repeat the experiment, maybe varying one factor if you so chose. And this can be either in the laboratory or it could be in the field, like the work that David Resnick specializes in, who spoke last year. He works on uh, guppies and other fishes in the wild in Trinidad, where he can actually manipulate populations in the wild. Now, uh, more commonly in experimental evolution, we have work done with something like bacteria or fruit flies, as you see here. 
You need something that can, is fairly easy to maintain. You can keep in large numbers and so forth. Now, what I've done is used house mice, laboratory house mice. The strain we work with is all albinos. But other than that, they're highly genetically variable. And again, this is an animal that's practical to study across multiple generations in fairly large numbers. Okay, so that was my first introduction. If you didn't like that one, let's try this one. This is the one that's sort of more physiological and, and biomedical. So we'll start with some background and rationale. And the first is the observation that individual differences, that is from person to person or animal to animal, are very large both in human beings and on other animals, both in the lab and in the wild. And of course, here you see Homer Simpson, who's kind of your classic couch potato, not moving around very much. We don't know very much at all about the causes of these individual differences. I mean, aside from obvious environmental factors like you know, where you live and so forth, but it's presumed that the differences in how active individual people are are going to be related to variation in both the motivation for being activity, active or maybe the reward that you get, say the physical sort of pleasure sensation, psychological pleasure you get from jogging, as well as differences in your physical abilities. I mean, you might have an individual that's highly motivated to run, but if they don't possess the basic cardiovascular capacity to be good at running, they're not likely to run very much. Now, in addition, how much you move about on a daily basis can be viewed as part of the homeostatic mechanisms for energy balance and body composition. And in fact, there's a, there's a pretty well supported hypothesis in the literature that how active you are is a trait that is regulated, sort of just like blood pressure, heart rate, those sorts of things are regulated, okay? Now the evidence for this is still just developing, but there's, there's a pretty good case in the literature that there's what's called an activity stat, something in our bodies that regulates the amount of physical activity. Now, in addition to, uh, well, well the, ne the next level of sort of analysis, we can imagine that both motivation and ability are going to be affected by many, many different genes, okay? In addition, they're going to be affected by environmental factors. So here's an example of an environmental factor. How close, to you, how close do you live to, say, a fitness club or a place you can go jogging? But then it's also clear that there may be interactions between environmental and genetic factors because here you see a couple of people on the right then in spite of having paid very good money to be a member of this fitness club, when they get to the damn door, instead of walking up the stairs, they take the escalator, kind of sort of defeating the purpose. So you can imagine that there would be interactions between genetic and environmental factors, and so individual people might not respond the same way to a training regimen or a dietary intervention or something like that. Now, also, you, you should understand that traits such as voluntary activity levels are not caused by a single gene, sort of like Len Nunney was talking about the fact that, you know, most cancers are not caused by a single gene and so forth. Things like how active you are are not going to be caused by a single gene or affected by just a single gene, but probably by tens or hundreds. And so we shouldn't expect to find the gene for activity, but we can hope to find some of the genes that account for a, an important fraction of the variation among individuals in a population. And then if we can do that, if we can identify those genes and we can understand how they work, what their mechanism of action is at the level of biochemistry and so forth, then it might lead us towards therapeutic strategies, if you will, for low activity individuals. I mean, education, you know, the doctor telling you you gotta be more active, all that stuff isn't working very well. So it's conceivable there could be something like pharmaceutical strategies. Now from either of those sort of introductory perspectives, um, I think you can see that as Darwin wrote 150 years ago, the whole organism is so tied together that when slight variations in one part occur and are accumulated through natural selection, other parts become modified. And he went on to say that this is a very important subject most imperfectly understood. So in other, in other words, if you have the evolution of, say, a behavioral trait, how do all the components that affect that behavioral trait evolve in some sort of a correlated fashion? So this is the kind of general topic that we're interested in in our lab. So the specific project I'm going to tell you about is this long-term selection experiment. It's been going about 57 generations now. And it involves selecting for high voluntary activity levels. And we use running wheels for the following reasons. First of all, wheel running is potentially physiologically taxing. If you've ever had a pet hamster, 
and you gave it a running wheel, you probably noted that many individual hamsters will run thousands of revolutions a night, squeak, 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 keep you awake all night. And it's the case that just your average rodent, your average mouse, rat, hamster, they like to run a substantial amount. And so wheel running is considered to be the sort of uh, classic self-rewarding behavior. You don't have to do anything to them or for them or reward them with anything external to make them run. Just your average run really does like to run quite a bit. Now, we had done some preliminary studies showing that if you take 20 or 30 mice or rats and you give them running wheels and you track their running across several days, what you'll find is it's not always the same individual that runs the most, but pretty close. So the high running individuals tend to be the same individuals over time and the low running over time as well. And so what that means is if you want to pick out the high runners or the low runners, you can do it pretty easily and pretty accurately. And then furthermore, if you look at the relationship between parents and offspring for wheel running, you can calculate what's called a, a narrow, sorry, this laser pointer isn't working, but you can calculate what's called a narrow sense heritability, and that, that number doesn't really matter. But that number is big enough. That's sort of telling you to the extent to which parents pass on the genes that affect wheel running to their offspring. That number is big enough that if you do an experiment where you select on wheel running, you're going to be able to get it to change rapidly enough, that is within two or three years, that you might have some hope of getting a renewal grant to continue your work. And that's an important point. Now the other thing is that wheel running is easy to automate. You can just put some sort of a counter on the wheel, hook it up to a computer. It's also known in rodents that it's an important regulator of body mass and composition. It has a huge impact on how much body fat a mouse or a rat has. And it's been argued in the literature that wheel running is indeed analogous to human voluntary activity. And if that's true, if it turns out that say some of the genetic and environmental factors that account for individual variation are similar, then obviously by studying mice we can learn something about the human condition. So the basic design of this experiment was back in uh, 1993 when I was still in Wisconsin. We got 224 mice. These were from an outbred strain that we just bought from a commercial supplier, Spread Golly, uh, in Indiana. And the important thing about this population of mice is if you look at how much genetic variation they have, it's actually similar to what you see in wild populations of mice and also similar to the amount of variation you see in human populations. So it's a reasonable model at that level. So the design for this experiment is we, we bred these mice for a couple of generations randomly in the lab, and then we split them up into eight different lines. Now, four of those lines serve as controls. What that means is we measure their wheel running every generation, but we do not pick the moms and the dads based on how much they run. We just pick them at random. And so their controls for this thing called random genetic drift, that is the tendency of a population to change its genetic composition over time, at least when it's a fairly small population, just due to sort of random sampling effects, okay? So there we have four of those control lines, and then in the other four lines, we pick the breeders based on how much they run. We pick the highest running males and, fe excuse me, males and females. And what we do is we attach to their cages a running wheel, I'll show you a picture in a minute. We let them have access to the wheel for six days, and then we use how much they run on days five and six as the criterion to pick the breeders. Now, let me make an important point here. In this experiment, we chose not to have any lines where we select for low activity, that is to make the couch potato line of mice. And the reason we didn't do that is as follows. It's because the, the trait of sort of very low activity versus very high activity You'd think it's the same trait, just different ends of a continuum, but it's not at all clear that it would be under these kinds of conditions. For example, if we selected for mice that didn't run very much at all, we might just be selecting for mice that were somehow afraid to enter the wheels, okay? And that wouldn't necessarily be the same trait as a high level of running. And this sort of takes off on a concept that's uh, growing, I think, in prevalence in human psychology that Active behaviors, things like getting out and jogging or going to the health club or playing basketball or what have you, are not necessarily the opposites of sedentary behaviors such as watching television, playing a video game or something like that. It's not at all clear that those are two ends of the same continuum based on the current human work. Uh, now another point is that any time you select for a low kind of behavioral, physiological, life history kind of trait, you have the, a pretty good possibility of decreasing that trait simply by increasing the frequency of what we call deleterious recessive alleles in the population. 
Uh, you know, you've all heard about sort of inbreeding depression and what can happen if you have close relatives and humans made increasing the frequency of a lot of rare genetic diseases. Same sort of thing could happen here if we selected for low running. And that, again, that's not really what we're after. We didn't want to make sort of sickly mice. We really wanted to understand, you know, what it is about high runners that differentiates them. Okay, so this is what the setup looks like. These are actually rat-sized wheels, about 1.1, a little over, say, three and a half feet in circumference. And they're hooked to regular cages, so the mice can choose to run. There's one that's running on the right there, and there's one that's sitting in the cage on the left. It's a completely voluntary activity. And what this shows here is progress through the first 50 generations. We do about four generations a year. And the blue lines are the four control lines, just looking at the average every generation. Now, the gap you see there is when we packed up shop and moved from Wisconsin to California. So for about a year, it, uh, we didn't measure wheel running as we were getting everything set up. So that's what the gap is there. Um, so, and you can see these are, these are females. And you can see the red lines there go up, 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 up for about the first 16 generations. So that shows that our selective breeding for high running was being very successful up to a point, and then we reached basically a limit up there. Now those are the females, and I can show you the males on the same axes, and what you can see is that the males run less than the females always in both the selected and control lines, but the sort of factorial difference, the, the percentage by which we increased running is virtually identical in the males and females. Okay, now this is my cue to show you a little movie of what these guys actually look like uh, when they're running. Okay, so on the right, you have a mouse from a control line, and you can see she's not doing a whole lot. Occasionally she runs a little bit, but on the left, that little mouse, she's running like crazy, running at much higher speed. You can see the little white piece of tape. Yeah, now, you know, the amazing thing is if you actually, look, at the top, she does a 360 and keeps going, okay? So anyway, you can see there's a, there's a sort of radical difference in especially the running speed between the selected line mice and the control line mice. Okay? All right. Okay. Oops. Stop. All right. Okay. Okay, so back to boring graphs. Um, what this shows here is the ratio of the selected lines to the control lines. So just dividing the selected by the control across generations. And you can see they increase up to about a 2.7 fold differential. And we, can, uh, we also did a study where we went out and we caught wild house mice in Wisconsin, raised them under the same conditions, tested them on our wheels. And we thought initially that maybe, we, you know, we figured they would run more. And we thought initially, and they did, they ran about sort of 70% more than our starting point. But we thought maybe we could only push lab mice up to that level and that would be it. But instead, you can see we were able to go uh, sort of way beyond that and surpass the level of running of wild house mice. Now, this is a graph uh, from a guy named Don Dewsbury at the University of Florida, who many years ago studied a whole bunch of different species of rodents. So each of these black dots here now is the average value for a different species of rodent. And it just, it's the amount of uh, running per day, revolutions per day, plotted versus the body size of the animal, just for convenience there. And if you overlay on top of that the difference between our control lines and our selected lines, what you see is that it spans most of the range of variation. So we've sort of spanned this range of variation with not many generations of breeding. So we would argue this is really a substantial evolutionary divergence compared with what you see among species in nature. And so it's reasonable then to go out and look for the physiological or neurobiological or genetic bases of these things. But the other point I want to make is that these selected mice are not off the scale. Okay? They're not sort of running at freakishly high levels. They're not running at abnormally high levels. And I think that's important because you probably wouldn't want to be studying a model that was sort of in that pathological range of activity. They're well within the range of what you see among species of wild rodents. Okay, so how do the mice from the selected lines run more? I can show you this graph again. This is the ratio of the running of the selected to control. And if you break it down into the, the differential in the amount of time spent running, this is for females. 
versus the average running speed, what you can see is the females at least have increased their running almost entirely by running faster, not for more minutes per day. And that brings up a bunch of interesting questions in and of itself. You can also see that there's this sort of clear limit that we're at and haven't been able to get beyond. If I show you the same thing for males, the point here is that the males have actually uh, evolved a somewhat different solution, if you will, as compared with the females. So they too mainly run faster, but they've also shown an increase in the amount of time spent running. And again, there's this selection limit for the males. So this is, this is a graph of the daily pattern. The black is the amount of running at night, so they, they almost all run at night. They're still nocturnal animals. And the yellow is the daytime running. And you can see that there's this big differential, but it begs the question of given that we keep selecting and selecting and selecting every generation, why is it that the selected lines haven't evolved, say, to you know, fill in that rectangle, sort of to keep running at high speeds all night? And we don't know the answer to that, but we're, that's one of the things we're trying to get to. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a sort of interesting observation. And the kinds of answers, there's various ways to get at this. There's genetic analyses you can do. But what I've been focusing on perhaps more is what I call functional answers, trying to get at the possibility that maybe the motivation for being active or possibly the reward, the sort of good feeling they get psychologically or physiologically from running, is it some sort of a maximum. It just can't feel any better, and so you just can't evolve them to run anymore. Or possibly something about the ability to run is at a maximum. Maybe they're using up all their glycogen stores or they're running out of lipids for fuel. You know, they're running several hours a night. Um, and, or maybe just the energetic cost is too high. You know, they just can't digest enough food to support that kind of activity. And these sorts of things are not mutually exclusive. I mean, it could be a couple of them going on at once. But if we can understand these, then this is where in this evolutionary physiology perspective we can get at some of the kinds of mechanisms that may constrain the evolutionary process. And <clears throat> without going into it today, I'll just say we've done a lot of experience, experiments to show that it's not the energetic cost. They can easily process a lot more food than they need to run uh, you know, many more kilometers. So that leaves us with motivation and ability. Okay, so how do the selected and control lines differ? One thing you might wonder about is what happens if you take away their wheels and you just put them in regular cages? And so this shows regular mouse cages put on top of very sensitive force transducers that can actually record any motion in the cage over a 24-hour period. And if you do that, this is what you see. Um, the 24-hour pattern of activity, again, all their activity is at night. That's in the, the middle section there. And you can see there's this huge differential in home cage activity for both sexes. So if you take away their wheels, their hyperactivity generalizes to the cage environment. Now what we don't know yet, but we just have developed the technology to be able to do, is to simultaneously look at the home cage activity when they have access to running wheels, but we, we don't have our data together yet. Hint, hint, graduate students. Okay, now, uh, activity levels, as I mentioned earlier, can also be viewed as part of the homeostatic mechanisms for energy balance and body composition. And you've all seen these sorts of messages for how much physical activity you should be getting. So if we look at these mice, it turns out that they have extremely low levels of body fat. In fact, they have less body fat than any strain of mice that's ever been studied. And this is true even when they're housed without access to running wheels, where they would normally burn off a lot of energy, they have this very low body fat. They eat more for their body size even when they're housed, housed without wheels. So this is great, right? They eat a lot, and yet they're lean, mean running machines. They stay skinny. And they show no differences in resting metabolic rate. So it's not like they've you know, hyped up their sort of resting energy expenditure to burn off the calories. There are a number of interesting endocrine correlates. One of the ones that, that I'll mention today is that they have higher circulating levels of corticosterone. Now, in, in humans, that would be cortisol. That's the equivalent hormone. And this you've probably heard of as kind of the classic stress hormone. You know, you get all stressed out and your court levels go up, like when you have to give a talk like this. Um, but it turns out that these high runner mice have very high levels of court. And so you might think, well, this is, you know, maybe this is sort of a bad thing. But the thing is that court is also a good basic metabolic hormone. One of its main functions is to mobilize energy for physical activity. And so it may be that these high court levels have evolved as one of the mechanisms that allows them to have these very high levels of sustained activity. 
On the other hand, we know from a variety of studies that sustained high court levels can be a bad thing. They can lead to you know, neuronal death in the brain and all sorts of things that can stunt growth. And so one of the things we found in our mice is that they have a reduced body size. And this is a graph showing just the average values for each of our eight lines, the four selected lines, the four control lines. And you can see there's a pretty strong negative relationship. Now that's correlational data, it doesn't prove causality. But it suggests that one of the sort of costs of this high court level may be a reduced growth rate and a reduced body size, okay? Okay, now let's, what I'm gonna do now is talk about some exercise adaptations and then I'm gonna talk about the brain and motivation side of things. So what kinds of exercise adaptations do we see? Well, we can take these mice, we can put them in a little treadmill. Now, if it were a human being, we'd have you wear a mask, but if you try to put a, mouse, a, ma a mask on a mouse, they just pull it off. So instead, we basically build the mask around the mouse, and then we, you know, around the whole treadmill, we have them run. And maximal oxygen consumption is considered to be the single best indicator of cardiopulmonary function. This is just a little bar graph that shows for the selected mice on the right, after you adjust for the differences in body size, they have about a 33% increase in their maximal aerobic capacity. That's a really big increase, okay? You can also just measure their flat out endurance ability running on a treadmill. You just see how long they can run. And in this graph, what I'm showing is data from one of my graduate students uh, where each data point now is an individual mouse. The red dots are from the selected lines, the blue from the control lines. And it's plotting how far they ran on day one versus day two. If they were perfectly consistent, they'd all fall along that little dashed line at 45 degrees. So the first thing you can see is this is actually quite a repeatable measure. The ones that have the high endurance tend to have high endurance on both days and the low both on both days. Um, but you can also see that the red dots are displaced up to the right. So on average, they have significantly higher endurance as you might expect. Now, you know from the Olympics that the guys with the best endurance are not the best sprinters, right? There's that kind of trade-off. So what about sprint speed? We measure sprint speed on a photocell timed racetrack set up along the side of the lab there. And if you look at sprint speed, there's no difference. So they have not shown a reduction in sprint speed. They have not shown evidence of a trade-off at that level. Okay. Now, if we go inside the animal and we look at things like skeletons, we find some interesting differences. One thing they have that they, the, uh, the, on the right is actually the femur of a mouse. On the, on the, the other thing is not a mouse femur. But um, they have larger femoral heads. So that's the little thing that fits into your hip socket, okay? And it kind of makes sense that if you're going to be running, you know, 15,000 kilometers a night on a running wheel, you might want to have a good, robust ball and socket joint to sort of spread, you know, spread out the stress of those bones rubbing against each other. Now, an interesting thing about this is that this is also true of human beings. This is the cover of uh, the prestigious journal Nature from a couple of years ago, where there was a big article called Born to Run. Um, and this was about human evolution. And these workers argued that one of the key characteristics of human evolution whether you, uh, if you look in the fossil record at our ancestors or if you compare human beings to the other apes, what you find is that humans have evolved a bunch of adaptations that seem to be there to support endurance locomotion. Human beings are good at endurance. That's why human hunting cultures, they could do things like chase down antelope on foot, okay? They just follow them for hours and hours and hours and eventually they tire them out, catch them, kill them, eat them. Okay? We're not particularly good sprinters, so that's why you don't want to have to run from a lion or something like that. But we are very good at endurance. And it's argued that large femoral heads are one of the skeletal features that supports our high endurance locomotion. Uh, our mice don't have longer legs, but they have thicker hind limb bones. And then another thing is that they have more symmetrical hind limb bones. So you probably know that your left leg and your right leg on average aren't going to be exactly the same length, okay? And you can measure that. You can measure it very accurately from the bones of the mice. And so in your typical mouse population and in our control lines, you find that there's some, there's some differences between the left and the right leg lengths. In our selected lines, those differences have disappeared in the sense that there's no longer a statistical difference between the lengths of the left and the right legs. Okay, so they become more perfectly symmetrical. Now, why might that be? Well, we're selecting for straight line running, and if you don't think this might matter, 
go home tonight and take a piece of cardboard, put it in one shoe, and walk around for a while and see how uncomfortable that is. Okay? Now, the other interesting thing is that they've also noticed this association in studies of English thoroughbred horses. They have made measurements of horses. They've looked at the symmetry of the horses, the left to right side, and found that the more symmetrical individuals make more money on the racetrack. Okay? So if you go to the track, what you want to do is look at the horse, pick out the most symmetrical one, and put your money on that one. I grew up in Vegas, so you should listen to the tips I give you. Okay. Uh, now they also have other things you might expect. They have larger hearts after adjusting for the difference in body size. They actually have reduced muscle mass. Now that might be a little counterintuitive at first until you think about like the Olympics again. It is the case that the best marathoners have substantially reduced muscle mass, you can see in this guy here, as compared with the best sprinters. And so our mice have evolved to reduce muscle mass. If you look at the details of how the muscles work, there are a bunch of changes, including things like changes in muscle fiber type composition. But here I'll just point out that they have increased insulin stimulated glucose uptake in some of their muscles. And they also have an increased number of glucose transporters in some of those muscles. So a variety of features that seem to have evolved to promote the high endurance abilities. Okay, now enough about the body. Let's talk about the brain, the sort of other side of the coin. Um, the first, one of the first things that we found about the mice is that they have larger brains. So, so much for the dumb jock kind of idea. These mice have larger brains and, uh, you know, the brain, as you're probably aware, is a very heterogeneous organ. There are lots of different parts of the brain and it's wired in an extremely complicated way. Uh, one of the main parts of the brain that you know about is the cerebellum that is responsible for control, you know, control of motor functions in essence. Uh, it's not the cerebellum that differs in size. So that was the surprising thing. So to get at what it is, what we're doing is taking brains and over to one of my grad students goes over to Loma Linda, scans them with an MRI, and then you can make these wonderful digital color-coded pictures. And with that, we can actually do 3D reconstructions and figure out the size of the different structures in the brain, and we'll eventually be able to figure out what it is of the brain that's become larger. Okay. Um, so here's a, a little couple of passages from an article that was also in this journal Nature a couple of years ago. And it was a little piece that was on ultra marathon athletes, ultra endurance athletes. And this guy Tim Noakes, who's a well-known uh, exercise physiologist in South Africa, said that the brain is the oft overlooked organ that sets ultra racers apart. They're mental freaks, not physiological ones. Now this is based on his studies that suggests that these ultra-endurance athletes aren't that different from other sort of similar athletes, but it's something about the brain that is really setting them apart. Now, another way to look at this, so I was, I was taking a flight to give a seminar somewhere, and in the airline flight magazine, there was this ad. Uh, this ad is from some company called Accenture. Now, I have no idea what Accenture is, okay? I still can't quite figure that out, but it says down there at the bottom, high performance delivered. And in the bottom left, it says consulting technology outsourcing. So like, I'm pretty sure Dick Cheney is involved, but I just don't really know what this company does. <laughs> but if you, if you look in their fine print there, they say what separates high performers from lesser competitors isn't just talent, it's the way they fuse their capability and mindset. And then in this ad, they actually you know, hired Tiger Woods, and they put this little scale on there where they say it's 50% attitude and 50% aptitude. So, you know, in the business world, they've got this all figured out. It's 50-50 brain and brawn, right? Okay, well, we wanted to get a little more, you know, quantitative about that with our mice. And so, um, if you look at the wheel running, this is a graph of wheel running ac across the first 20 months of life. After this point, mice start dying of old age. So this is most of the time that sort of matters in the life of a mouse. And what you can see, the upper lines are the uh, selected lines of mice, the bottom line, the controls that this wheel running persists for most of the lifespan. Okay, so it's not just over those six days we test them, but it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing characteristic of these animals. And it's also quite general in the following sense. Uh, we've done things like house them in constant dark, thinking maybe they're somehow constrained by the light cycle. 
they show the similar differential. Constant light, same thing. You separate their cages from, with a, from the wheel with a tube, so they have to go back and forth, same differential. You put little hurdles in the wheels like this, so they have to jump over them. It slows them way down, but they still run two and a half, three times as much as the controls. So sort of no matter what you do, this is a very robust behavioral difference. And uh, you know, if you, if you increase how hard it is to turn the wheels, they still run more. If you go so far as to lock the wheels, the little buggers climb more in the wheels. So it's like they, they we, we, so from these data, we really want to say that they clearly are sort of more highly motivated to run. They really want to run, okay? But we'd like to look more directly at the brain and see if we can find evidence from the brain itself that they differ in motivation. And so one of the experiments we've done is to try to look <clears throat> at the activity of different brain regions when they're running. Now, you can't get a mouse in a wheel, in an MRI, in a magnet, the metal, it blows, you can't, can't do it, right? But what you can do is to let the animals run on wheels, go in, take the mice, sample the brains, and you can use molecular biology techniques. Uh, this, this thing called CFOS is a transcription factor. And it expresses itself in the brain about, at highest levels, about two hours after some behavioral activity. And so what we did was a study where we took mice and we gave them the usual six days of wheel access as if we were going to choose the breeders. And then on the seventh day, we went in and for half the mice, we blocked the wheels. So they were all like all hyped up and ready to go, but they couldn't run. And the other half of the mice could run. And then uh, two hours later, at the time of normal peak running, we sampled the brains. And we looked at 23 different brain regions that were chosen because they were known to be involved in motivation, reward, control of locomotion. And indeed, in 14 of those 23 brain regions, we found that they showed higher activity when you had blocked the wheels. So those brain regions were lighting up, indicating activity, when you took away their wheels. And we would like to think that indicates something about motivation, although we, we will acknowledge it could represent stress or frustration or anxiety or maybe even depression. But the important thing is that four of those regions showed evidence for greater motivation in the selected line. So in this little bar graph, on <clears throat> the right side, I've got mice that had free access to running wheels. So they were running. And if you look at their brains, you can see in the black and the white bars, there's no difference. But if you look at the mice that had blocked wheels, the activity of this brain region went up, but it went up much more in the selected mice. And that's just actually a little section of a brain showing that you can count the number of cells that had indication of neuronal activity. You can see it's really quite a dramatic difference there. So the brain seems to show direct evidence then for differences in how they respond to wheels or taking away their wheels. The next thing we wanted to do is kind of figure out what neurotransmitter was, was going on. You know, was it endogenous opiates or serotonin or dopamine? Now, dopamine's a logical candidate <clears throat> because it's known to be involved in control of locomotion, uh, Parkinson's disease, and so forth. And so <clears throat> we've taken a pharmacological approach where we have uh, administered all of these different drugs and others to the mice and then looked at what it does to wheel running. And you can see there's a whole bunch of drugs there that target dopamine, some that target serotonin, Prozac, uh, others that uh, target endogenous opioids to get at the idea of the runner's high, which has been more or less debunked in terms of uh, opiates being involved. And to make a long story short, several of the dopamine drugs have differential effects on the selected and control lines. For example, if you give them Ritalin, what you find is that it increases running in the control lines, much as it does in a so-called normal kid, and it decreases running in the high runner lines of mice. And here's some actual data. So what this shows is uh, on, the, on the horizontal axis, this is time after they've been given an injection, either of just saline with no drug, or various doses of Ritalin, one particular dose here. And the blue are the control lines, and you can see that after you give them the Ritalin, a little bit later, maybe an hour later, they actually experience a stimulation of activity because Ritalin is a stimulant, right? But the high runner mice, after you give them the Ritalin, what happens? Boom, their wheel running plummets almost down to the level of the controls, and then it wears off. Now, that's why kids who are on Ritalin have to have it two, three, four times a day because it wears off rapidly. With mice, of course, it wears off much more rapidly because they're a small animal with a much higher metabolic rate per unit of mouse. So what this means, and we've had some funding to explore this, is that these selected lines of mice are potentially a useful model for studying human ADHD. 
Now, an important point, too, is that all those different drugs that we've administered, a number of them will increase running in the control lines like Ritalin, amphetamine, CoQ. That'll, that'll make the regular mice run more. We've never yet found a drug that will increase running in the selected lines. And so that reinforces this point that something is at a limit. Now, whether it's motivation or ability, we still don't know, but we're trying to go further and understand that. And so the last thing I'm going to tell you about today before I wrap up is some very recent work that we've done uh, with one of my graduate students and a collaborator at Michigan State University, where we've been looking at the effects of a so-called Western diet. So this is a diet, a mouse chow you can buy, that's very high in fat and also has added sucrose to mimic you know, going to McDonald's, having a Big Mac and a chocolate fudge sundae. Okay? And so in this experiment, we had a total of 200 mice selected and control, um, and they either had wheels or no wheels, and then they had regular diet or, stand, or this Western diet. And if you look at this, things like body fat, you got all the sort of expected results. So this is a, this little bar graph showing uh, the mass of this fat pad. It's one of the major fat depots in a mouse. It's back in, back in, the, in the sort of back of the abdomen. And you can see in, on a standard diet, the control mice with no wheels had about, what, 0.7 grams of fat. If you give them this Western diet, boom, they put on fat like crazy. It goes up to two grams, so what, it all about triples in size, okay? Now, if you take those same uh, mice like that and you have them have access to a running wheel, you can see it has somewhat of a positive effect in the sense of reducing the amount of fat. They still get fat, but they don't get as fat. Now, if you add to this picture the selected lines of mice, same sort of thing happens. They get fat if you give them a Western diet. Uh, but there is this beneficial effect of having access to a running wheel. And it's, it's sort of an even bigger effect, which you sort of might expect because they're running more. But the amazing thing was, and so this is kind of all expected stuff. If you looked at the wheel running of the mice, when you gave them the Western diet, the control mice on the left there, it had absolutely no effect. They ran about 3,000 revolutions a night, whether they had regular chow or this Western diet high in fat and sucrose. But look what happened to the high runner mice. Remember, I've just told you they've been at a selection limit. We keep breeding and breeding the high runners. They're not evolving anymore for like 35 generations. We give them cocaine. We give them amphetamine. It doesn't make them run more. We've given them sugar in their water to, you know, carbohydrate load. It doesn't make them run more. Nothing works. We give them this high-fat diet and a 50% increase in running. So what the heck is going on? Well, there are at least two possibilities. One is that it's a direct metabolic fuel usage availability kind of situation. Remember I told you they have extremely low body fat, lower than any strain of mouse that's ever been studied. These guys are running six, seven hours a night. Over that kind of time course, the energy has to be coming mostly from fat. So suddenly you give them extra fat in their diet and they're able to run more. So that would imply that they were hyper motivated. They're motivated to run even more than they metabolically can. You give them a high fat diet, that constraint is released and they run 50% more. But there's another possibility. There's a bunch of studies recently showing that if you give high fat diet to rats, it has major effects on the reward centers of the brain. And they've done studies with human beings recently where they've taken obese and non-obese individuals put them in an fMRI machine, a magnetic resonance image machine that can look at the blood flow in the brain. They've given them a milkshake and found that the brain of the obese person lights up in a very different way than the non-obese person. So it's possible that this is a direct effect on the sort of motivation for running or the reward they're getting from running. So we still have two possibilities, right? Really interesting phenomenon to, to figure out. But the other point is that these mice are clearly unique. A regular mouse, you give it a high fat diet, it gets obese and so forth, no effect on activity. But these guys, for whatever reason, they're stimulated to run. So wouldn't that be great if we could figure out what's going on? You can stop at McDonald's, you pig out, you go home, and as soon as you get home, you put on the running shoes and shorts and you get out and you jog, because you've got to, you feel compelled to. Okay, so let me give you a few conclusions and a couple of future direction slides. So I, I hope I've shown you that this experimental evolution approach, in this case by what we call selective breeding, can be a rapid and effective way to alter the characteristics of organisms, plants, animals, bacteria, what have you.
and increase our understanding of both physiology and evolution. Now, the evolutionary increases in voluntary activity that we've seen in this particular study clearly have entailed alterations in the brain, motivation, or reward, as well as alterations in their physical abilities to perform endurance-type activities. Now, some of the traits that we've seen changing, like the increase in maximal oxygen consumption, heart size, more sy symmetrical hind limb bones, those clearly seem to represent adaptations that support the high locomotor activity. But then there are others, like this high court level, where it's not clear those could, in fact, be maladaptive things that are just sort of an unfortunate byproduct of having tweaked the reward circuitry of the brain and also perhaps resulting in a higher output of corticosterone. <clears throat> So some of the future directions that we're pursuing, I mean, obviously we want to figure out what the heck is going on with this Western diet. What is it that is making them run 50% more when you just simply change their diet? And we'd also like to know, are they perhaps protected from the bad effects of Western diet? Like, for example, do they not develop the metabolic syndrome, diabetes, those sorts of things, uh, because of this increase in activity? We want to unravel the neural and psychological mechanisms of motivation for exercise in general. And one of our working hypotheses is that what we've done with these high runner mice is sort of like creating, uh, creating an addiction. So if you think about the idea that the average mouse likes to run in the sense they'll run several kilometers a night, what we may have done is made it so it doesn't feel as good for our mice when they run. So in order for it to feel as good as a regular mouse, they have to run faster and faster and faster. So that would be the kind of classic addiction model where you have to have more and more and more of the drug to feel as good as you did back at the beginning. Of course, we want ultimately to find the genes that cause higher running, and we have a bunch of collaborators working on mapping, uh, mapping uh, studies right now. If we can find these genes and we can understand what those genes are actually doing, then it may be the case that we can consider translating these findings to human beings. We might be able to develop drugs that would make it more pleasurable for people to exercise. Okay? Uh, and the reason that could be important is because other things like education, diet, and so forth simply haven't worked, and we need some other kinds of tools. Okay, well, I'll stop there, and I'd be happy to take questions. Hi, Ted. Um, so this is the obvious question for all the people that saw your mice going around in the wheel. Um, you know, none of us like running on a treadmill. So it occurs to me that what if the mice, what they really like to do is have fun? And what they really want to do is spin that wheel and go round and round. And if you had selected, I mean, speculate, if you had chosen to select, say, by activity in a maze, you know, just or just put them in an arena and said, maybe you wouldn't have got the same dramatic results. What do you think? Well, remember that I showed you those data for activity in a regular cage, and it shows exactly the same differential, two and a half, three times higher. Yes. Yeah, so I actually have one of my former grad students from Wisconsin is now a professor at University of Illinois, and he's doing a selection experiment very much like this, except what he's selecting on is home cage activity, okay? So we're going to have, in a few years, a very nice parallel to this, where, as Dr. Fairbairn was saying, instead of selecting for running on a wheel, they were selected for activity in a home cage. So those, those results will be forthcoming, NIH willing. Hi, my name's Ann Platzer, as you know. Um, how many uh, generations would it take if you bred the high active female to a normal male for it to go back down to be normal, their offspring? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. She's asking, what if you crossed the selected lines and the control lines, and my, my grad student Rob out there who does this uh, is, is not, just, just answer the question, Rob. Well, it turns out that um, when you do that, the F1 generation, the, the babies, the offspring, they run as much as the high runner. So there's directional dominance in the direction of high running, okay? Um, which is, is a whole other story in and of itself, why you would have dominance in that direction. But 
But that's the situation with the F1. And if you keep, you know, breeding them, you can get spread out of the variation and so forth. But I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question. But in the F1, at least, they run as much as the high runners. Well, if you started selecting back down, you would probably have, it would probably take, you know, I would predict around 15 generations to get back down to the starting point if you did that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So we've done two studies on that, and uh, both of them gave uh, sort of partial results in support of that, depending on which sex you looked at and whether they were housed with or without wheels. So there's a whole lot of permutations to that. You know, there's males, females, with wheels, without wheels, that sort of thing. And the studies we've done so far that are published are really only preliminary in that regard. And the answer is yes for some groups and no for other groups. So that it, the aging studies are difficult because you need very large sample sizes and you have to be prepared to fund those mice living for three, four, even up to four and a half years. So they're, they're a difficult proposition to, to get into. Um, well. Uh, thing of the fox and the sloth, what does that really have to do with mice? That's that's a that's a very good question. What that has to do with is giving the broader context of the mouse work, and so how this might relate to differences among organisms out in nature. Okay, well, like, they, like, I, we know, all know that the sloth runs slow, and the coyote runs really fast. So like, what, how is that a point to like, I don't really get that. Okay. I'll, I'll explain that to you tonight in bed. <laughs> Question down there? Sure, go ahead. Maybe I can hear you. Yeah. Go ahead with your question. I can probably hear you. Well, how do mice train and then, like, what goes into the serotonin factor? Do those translate to humans? So if we learn what changes those, how do we know that's going to be maintained in the human thing? Yeah, well, you know, virtually all of the pharmacological research is done with mice and rats. And so all the drugs that are developed for human psychotherapy are initially tested initially in mice and rats, and, and uh, it turns out that there's a very good translatability there. And so we feel the genes, the genetic translation would be just as... Yeah, you know, there are different complexities in the numbers and the families of dopamine receptors, but generally speaking, what it does to a mouse or a rat is going to be very similar to what it does to a human, at least in terms of things like stimulating appetite or activity or treating obesity or what have you. you know, it's, it's really a very useful model for that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, on the blue section of the brain on the diagram mm -hmm. earlier, I, I couldn't make, it, make out the, what the blue part was. I'd have to go was. back and look, but anyway, what was the question? Uh, that, that was, sorry, that was it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I forget which one was labeled blue, but. Thank you. Is uh, anybody doing studies on selecting for high VO2 max mice as a comparison? Yeah, so actually I have some colleagues that have done that in rats, not in mice, and they selected directly on VO2 max. And one of the results they've gotten is that they also show a difference in wheel running. So when you select directly on the performance trait, this voluntary behavior of wheel running shows some change. You know, not as dramatic as this or as in VO2 max itself, but it does show some difference. So that has been done, yes. Yeah. 
this isn't a question. I wondered if you might just tell people about the interesting connection with maternal behavior. What happens to those females and their babies? I remember you found some pretty interesting stuff about that. Well, the, so we did a big study back around generation 20-something and could find absolutely no differences in the care of the babies by the moms. No differences in fertility, litter size, anything. So no evidence that it was causing any problems there. More recently, we found some evidence that in some generations, but not others, some of the selected lines tend to lose their litters between birth and weaning. And one of my students is trying to sort out what's going on with that right now. But it's not a consistent thing. It seems to vary from generation to generation. So it's conceivable that the selected lines are somewhat more stress responsive. And so only in those generations where, you know, something unusual is going on, like they're, you know, painting in the animal rooms or something like that, that, that it causes a problem. But it's not, a, it's not really a consistent difference. So, so far, we haven't had any dramatic things. What, the one thing we have found that's interesting is we've looked at several different tests of aggression, whether they're more aggressive to each other, the, the females to the males, if they have pups, all this kind of thing. We haven't found any differences with one exception. The one exception we found is in what's called predatory aggression. If you drop crickets into the cage and you record how rapidly and efficiently they attack and kill and eat the crickets, the selected mice are much more aggressive towards crickets. They're much better little predators. And one of the reasons that's interesting is because if you think about it, you know, what is it that you need to evolve a predator? You need an animal that moves around a lot so it will encounter prey frequently enough. And when it encounters those prey, it has to know what to do with them which is kill them and eat them. And so selection simply on activity has led to this correlated response in predatory aggression, presumably because dopamine is involved both in the control of locomotion and in the control of aggression. But it suggests that there's this sort of axis of genetic variation that would be conducive to the evolution of sort of widely foraging predatory animals, or, or the opposite. So that's sort of an interesting thing. Yeah, Anne. Yeah, so she's asking about intelligence. Yeah, we have Johnny. done some studies uh, with maze learning sorts of things. Learning. Yeah, like, maze like, learning, and yes. have not been able to detect any obvious differences. Do you think, oh, you've already done it. Mm -hmm. Oh. I mean, there's always more you can do, because getting at intelligence in a mouse or a rat, you know, requires very different sort of physical constructs and interpretation than a, you know, Stanford Binet IQ test, obviously. Uh, we tried to give them those, and they just sort of wandered around on the paper and wouldn't fill it in little boxes. So, uh, but we haven't found any obvious differences in things like maze learning ability in these guys. Well, if there are no further questions, uh, do you agree that indeed science is fun? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, Ted, thank you very much. Much appreciated.